Konnichiwa, bitches. Uh, I am back from uh, from Japan. I have definitely not run into any Jones. I tried my best to go and find him. I hung out around the National Stadium in Tokyo. No Eddie in sight, uh, despite all of your requests on social media for me, for me to spear tackle him uh, or, you know, make any sort of uh, comment or, or, or engage in some sort of activity that would land me in jail in Japan. But I am back um, and I am joined by the usual suspects. Uh, to talk about this Wallaby squad, to talk about this squad of 35 that are heading off to Argentina. We'll also dive a little bit into a match that might have happened over the weekend, uh, some some game in Perth in the rain. It's uh, sort of a bit like that. I don't, I can't, don't even remember at this point. It was one of those games. But first and foremost, I've got the other Nick by my side, Nick, Hart, uh, Nick Hartman. How are we feeling? How Are we licking wounds? Are we feeling, are we feeling a little bit better after... Uh, after a couple of days off from the sidelines after that Saturn result? Um, I'm feeling pretty neutral. Um, I'm excited for Argentina. Um, I don't think uh, Doom and Gloom should accompany losing to the best team in the world. I mean, what a great team. They beat us away with their B team, um, which we'll get into later, uh, shortly. Um, but I'm, I'm fine. That's nice. It's nice yeah. to be, like, fine. Like, yeah. simple neutral. It's kind of a... I don't know, maybe like the thing is, we've also uh, we've just we were talking about before we started recording how just many chaotic reactions we've seen to like, oh my god, we lost to South Africa, uh, who are clearly playing much better rugby than us right now, and are the yeah. world number ones, back to back World Cup champions. Rassi Erasmus has got them running through walls and playing ridiculous rugby, but how dare we lose to them? Oh man, with us. Five matches in, the team's only been together for several weeks. No context. But, of course, how dare we lose to them? Nathan, how do we feel about all of that? I mean, how dare Joe not be able to turn around a team in this long? Like, Oh, I know. You know he's he's had four tests. Oh, fuck. And three of those were wins. Like, we should be world number ones by now. Fuck. How are we not world number ones? How are we not, like, beating everybody? Like, <laughs> it's almost like this thing takes time and practice. Huh. Mate, you, what you you're talking mm-hmm. on the internet. People don't understand time and patience. That's not how how this works. <laughs> but I am disappointed that you didn't go crash tackle Eddie. I had the bow money ready to go and everything. I know. <laughs> so many people so many people had said, yeah, look, if you actually crash tackle him and end up in jail, we will contribute to a to a legal fund. Which was very sweet of you all. That's very nice for you to not to, to know that I wouldn't just be uh, up Was there any wreck beyond when you're in Japan? Uh, no, there wasn't, unfortunately, which was a bit disappointing. Um, so I, hot- I, when I was there, I went to the Kiko Kunabua Stadium, that mm-hmm. Japanese rugby stadium, mm-hmm. um, and I saw two games. There two games back to back, and one of them was uh, Jake White's team, Suntory Sungalith. Oh yeah, and I think Willie fun. Brits was playing for him. Yeah, it was it was Ooh. really good, and the tickets were like uh, the equivalent of like twenty bucks. Shit, and, that's um, good. Yeah, so in Japan, because they have company teams, um, so like ones like NEC, you know, that electronics brand, they clearly had a bay of employees supporting and chanting the whole game. And, and as soon as the team was, the game was over, they all just left and they sh- went back to their normal lives. Um, <laughs> but yeah, it was great. And and on the food, they on the, you know, the drinks and food menu, I can't remember, did it get a beer? I can't remember, but I tried to buy a thing called a scrum potato, but unfortunately, oh, they're all sold good. out. Yeah, it does sound yeah. good, doesn't it? No wonder, no wonder they're sold out. <laughs> yeah. yeah, um, but yeah, that's my um story. Beautiful, nice- um, really beautiful area. That I mean, you know, like Japan's beautiful, but where that rugby setting is, yeah, very nice. Yeah, unfortunately, it was like peak summer when I was there, it was fucking hot. Like we, we had a couple of days where the temperature was like getting up, up 35, 40 degrees. So it was definitely not uh, rugby weather. I mean, every day is rugby weather if you could have it, but uh, yeah, it was, it was bloody hot and humid. I love, can I just say, I do love the concept of like corporate rugby teams and like you get to go out if you're a member of the, of a business and like go out and actually like you know go watch the rugby for a day or whatever as as a, as a member of, of an actual business, and like you're you're probably clocked in time to actually be go and watch rugby. That would be terrible. I like like oh that sounds awful to me. Here's a fun impromptu left field topic question: Which Australian company would you like to see have a rugby team? 
I'm just going to throw this out here. This is completely ad-libbed, random question that I'm throwing Nick and Nathan under the bus. Which Australian company do you think should have uh-huh. a corporate rugby team in line with the Japanese style? Hills Hoist. <laughs> I feel like you could come up with some sort of analogy, like, or like, yeah. what would be the mascot? A goon bag or something? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> they just clothesline yeah. people. That's clothesline, yeah, 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 yeah. It's like only going, only tackling high, Captain by Tol- uh, Tolly Latu. Um, <laughs> something like, something in that regard. I'm trying to think, what would be, what would be the Queensland equivalent? What can we, what can we get up there? What's like, because four X is already sort of used for like other sort of teams. What's another sort of? Bundy, Queensland brand. Bundy, oh, the, Bund- the Bundaberg Reds. Maybe maybe Bluey, because Bluey is such an industry now. Yeah, that would be a good one. Bundaberg Bears, I was, I was thinking like you could name it after the after the actual uh, freaking what's it called, the the, 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 the mascot of, of Bundaberg Rum. That, that uh, how, about, polar bear. how about we just bring back the HSBC Waratahs? Because like that's that was the Waratahs at its peak. <laughs> just just commit to the bit. Yeah, mm. and thank you to HSBC for securing us as interviews earlier this year. Yes, true. Yeah, we we are also under contractual obligation to keep mentioning them uh, in, in every single uh, interview going forward. Uh, you know, same as it is. Uh, also, uh, if I don't know why, in answer to this random impromptu left field question, uh, oh, for some reason I'm thinking BHP, BHP Billiton. Like you could make some sort of pun about an open cut mine and like digging down, like you know. Oh, Rio Tinto. Oh, <laughs> fucking hell! All right, so that's that's where we're going with this pod today. What's it? Jesus I'm, Christ, I'm gonna bleep that. I'm just gonna bleep that next, like that last five seconds, because Jesus Christ! So oh I was just gonna God. go with the, the Fortescue Western Force, because like you know, Andrew Forrest is already there, but yeah, yes. like uh, yeah, in many ways, he's already got one. The R M Williams, <laughs> the R M Williams Wallabies. Yeah. Aaron Williams Wallabies. Well, I mean, pretty much, you know, you may as well lean into a stereotype around uh, around them. So may as well in, in, enjoy it and, and and jump into it. But hey, there you go. Which com- which Australian corporate company would you like to see uh, have a rugby team? Let's answer that question. We'll throw it out to Twitter. I, I would just like to say that my comment about Rio Tinto. I don't know if you boys know, but have you heard like the the Duke and Gorge? Do you know about this? Lot, have a, have like it's actually or... based uh, based on something that's fucking awful. No, it was yeah, just no, Gorgeous in Australia. Oh yeah, no, no, yeah, yeah, we know yeah, about yeah, it. yeah, yeah. It's fucking awful. I just can't get over how no one got shot for that. <laughs> it does raise a good point. It's true. It is very true. <laughs> well, let's dive in. Without further ado, let's dive into uh, this Wallabies co- uh, squad right here. Um, 35 players will be heading off uh, on the two-test tour of Argentina, playing at La Plata and Santa Fe um, after, not this weekend, but the next weekend starting off. Um, let's first of all talk about thoughts, feelings, opinions. We'll also kind of, uh, while we're doing this, touch a little bit on the performance of the Wallabies uh, at Perth, of course, going down 30-12 to 12 to the box and kind of talk about where we think some of the issues that were exposed in that game might be addressed with this team if they get addressed with this team um, and kind of go, well, you know, seeing as it is a bit of a, a long game and a journey here with Joe Schmidt, will do we see the next natural progression of of his side? Um, Nathan, I'll, st- I'll throw to you first here. General feeling vibe with this particular uh, squad, with this particular squad. I mean, realistically, I don't think much changes. Like it's just more of like, I mean, getting Panga and Mosa back tonight um, just adds more depth to the sort of the front row. People like, you know, Josh Canham, David Velawati coming back. They've all just been, you know, solid Super Rugby performers that are deserving of a call-up just for wider numbers. Um, I mean, what's going to be huge is getting Tani Tupo back. Like, we miss his explosiveness. We miss his sort of presence as a game-breaker because of, you know, the death of his father, which, I mean, naturally he's, you know, took some, took some time off to deal with that and grieve. As, and, you know, we wish him all the best. But he's going to be huge against Argentina. And you couple that with getting Nick Frost back, Jeremy Williams back, these sort of guys that can really sort of own that forwards battle and then just sort of lay the platform for our backs to, to do something, which we probably just didn't get against South Africa, that's going to be crucial heading over there. I think head, head over probably... 
probably as this pod comes out, to be honest. They'll be on a flight to Argentina, so it's going to be exciting two weeks. Interesting two weeks. Very interesting two weeks. I feel like there there, there is a, a lot to like about this. There's a lot of question marks as well for me, um, Not ne- but not necessarily bad question marks like, uh, some of the the new additions and bring-ins, I'm quite keen to see e- um, either Don Wallaby Gold or return back to Wallaby Gold after a notable absence. Mr. Hartman, um, mm-hmm. you you watch the rugby on the weekend. You you indeed follow rugby. Uh, what are your thoughts on this particular squad? Are you do, is it a case of being in the same place again, or are you feeling are we are we still neutral, or are we happy? Um, I think I'm still neutral. I, uh, yeah, like Nathan said, it's good to have uh, BPA back. The uh, hooker is, is certainly a kind of weak spot for us at the moment. Um, and you know, I don't even make a joke about Tolu Larger there, but it, it is. Um, will BPA change that? I've never been too impressed by him. Um, so look, you know, hopefully it all works out. Um, the rest of the squad, I just uh, kind of a bit forgettable. No offense, but great to have Tupo back. Um, Nathan is how, how's Bell going? He he went off injured. Yeah, no, he's good. It was, that, that was more just like he had a cut over his eye, and they just they subbed him off, not thinking that they were going to lose every single lot of front rower. So yeah, um, kind of it was more just a sort of a risk that just didn't pay off, and also taking care of a guy with his first game back from that. That toe injury. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so, look, that's good to have him and Tupo back. The Waratahs uh, starting front row. What I would have to have Pareki back um, as hooker. Um, but, yeah, look, nothing too wild. Um, I guess the bigger question for me is that uh, Joe Schmidt is still doing the home ground thing, past Marika Korobetti. I... Obviously, there's a bit of technical details in there, getting the guys back from Europe. You know, Will Skelton's been talked about a lot, but he's in preseason. So, and then there's you know, like contract factors and all that. So, I'm not really, um, I'm not really sure that's headed. Um, if it was me, it'd be open Sutter. Look, it hasn't really affected the box. So, um, yeah, look, I'm just still kind of neutral. I do actually want it is it does lead to a, a bit of a broader question about the whole like whether we should go open slather or not. Um, I think Schmidt has done something a little bit like actually something quite smart here in that regard. I mean, of course, there's Marika, but I think uh, bringing in a couple of a couple of the new recruits who have come back from overseas um, and come into an Australian side. Um, I mean, the first one that immediately comes to mind is Brendan Payinger and Mosa. Hasn't played a game for the Western Force yet, um, but he's back off from a stint uh, overseas and he's straight into that Wallaby squad. Um, contrary to you, I actually, I do rate him. I just, I've been, you know, my, I first saw him back in Greater Sydney Ram days, uh, Western Sydney Rams days when he was like the equal highest price. Yeah, there we, we go. There we we go. You, you missed me, didn't you? You knew, I knew you missed it. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone um, playing at home. The, the, I think it's thirteen minutes. Thirteen the, the minutes. 13, Fourteen minutes. That's the the over under was set about ten. Yep, absolutely. There it is, and it will. It's a and and one day I feel like you guys are going to say one day you're you're going to do a podcast without an NRC reference. Never going to happen, guys. Never going to freaking happen. Um, but yeah, going back to that point, I I think BPA. I mean, I do agree with you, Nick, that there is a lot of question marks around the hooker position. Um, but and I know. I know that it's maybe it comes down to personal team bias or anything, but I, you know, I do think Parecki, if we had if we had them both fit, Parecki and Lonigan would probably be the starting the starting hookers. I think uh, Parecki's a good starter, and I think Lonnie, Lonigan is a pretty good finisher. Um, nothing against uh, Nasser or or Matty Fesler, and I think Matty Fesler has had moments of promise uh, and consistency um, playing. Uh, but I'm just very excited to see what BPA has learned because um, he always was a passionate guy. He always kind of threw himself into a lot of games, even if his consistency wasn't uh, wasn't great. Um, so I'm kind of excited to see what time, you know, uh, in other lands has uh, has delivered for him. And I'm very glad to hear Bell is back. That makes things, you know, uh, just seeing the amount of players go off, <laughs> the amount of forwards go off in that uh, in Perth was just 
it, oh, it was so triggering and terrifying and, and nervous and nerve wracking to me. Uh, yeah, because, yeah, I mean, I'm not going to lie, that scrum, that whole situation around the scrum, a scrum until like, you know, we had to go uncontested, we were looking okay uh, against the box. And considering as well as how much New Zealand demolished Argentina's scrum in that second match at Eden Park, maybe it's the Eden Park factor as well. Um, there is a way for us to get on top of Argentina. There, would you? Would you, Nathan? Would you agree that like we have something in there? Sorry, sorry. I just want to confirm this with Nathan before he begins. But talking about New Zealand scrum, aren't two of their props born in Australia? Uh, <laughs> it's like Tyrell Marty, Lomax and Tony Williams. Williams. Yeah, it's Marty Williams. He was he was he played in Perth, I think, for a bit, and then he moved over. Um, I, I mean, I'll, I'll have to confirm that, but um, you're definitely. I mean, no, he lived in so lived in Australia, but wasn't born in Australia, right? But definitely, definitely played in WA, and then yeah, you've got Tyrell Lemax, who's born in Canberra, went to school in Canberra, and then was playing for the Rebels before getting picked up by somebody else. But I mean, yeah, like, here you go, Tomati Williams, according to Wikipedia, moved to Perth when he was only a few months old. So there you go. So he would. He, he probably has some links to Australia in terms of... And he went back like, when he was 16. So just got away, got away. He was in WA and was like, nah, not for me. Um, but like on the scrum, okay, can we can we bring up that... Um, I kind of remember the, the dude's name with the, the most acid take I've seen this year about... Oh, as, acid as in the drug and also acid in terms of how it affects our brain. <laughs> take, take your pick. <laughs> like... What? What? Like, I've I've got so many questions. Like, I, I also kind of want to know what was what was going on in terms of like, I kind of I want what whatever he was on when he came up with that. I want that because, like, it kind of fails the message. Yes, imagine a world where we've sort of won scrum penalties and we're going. You know what? Nah, we don't want to really deal with this. Why are we then make our rolling mall infinitely weaker so that we all of a sudden can't stop it when they run in three rolling mall tries? <laughs> Like, I get it. It was probably, this is all essentially, you know, to f- fear monger and get a, a rise out of people. Congratulations, it's worked. But you just kind of look like an idiot. So, like, I was sort of, that first sort of 40, 45 minutes of the game, I was actually quite impressed with sort of how our forwards were going. We looked, like, even smarter. Like, that 50-22 off the scrum. Perfect. That was amazing. Yeah, amazing. And that was some- champagne. Yeah, that was really good. And but I reckon that, that would... That that they yeah. saw in the sort of review that from the first game that hey they're just going to spread across. Let's ramp back inside and play. In, you know, if they rush up again, we'll just keep to the line. Mm. The kicks over the like the sort of crossfield kicks. One was horrific on, on our own line, and you should have ended up in a try if not for a great Tom Wright try saver. But like there was clear method there of hey their rush defense is uh, giving us zero time to be creative. How do we get past it? And, mm. and by the end of the game, they were sort of working out the right stage to do it. And Max Jones nearly scored. But like, obviously, you need a bit more time. Like, this team obviously needs a bit more time. And the fact that we have we scored one try in 160 minutes against them, and that was against 13 men, is a concern. Like, let's not sugarcoat this. But overall, like, it wasn't a case of, oh, we haven't walked away from South Africans being like, God, our scrum sucked. And God, like, it was a considerable improvement with, front row is still to come back in the squad. Mm. I do. I'm a little worried considering we had to go uncontested, how like that squad, how that, like, I feel like we, we may have been hit with a reality check. Um, if we hadn't, if we hadn't lost so many forwards and we would have, you know, faced the bomb squad, um, which would have been, you would don't have been, know. You don't know. We that's had, the thing. Like, like yeah. we had James Slipper to come on as well. Like he's a solid scrummer. We had yeah. Billy Pollard to come on. Like we had good players to come on. Mm. Mm-hmm. That's true. That is very, very true. Um, Slips is okay, isn't he? Because he got concussed, um, didn't he? In that it was, yeah, it was a, it was a, concu- it was a, a concussion, wasn't it? I'm, I'm just drawing yeah, a blank. So, mm. um, Slips and Alto were both concussions, so they'll <laughs> serve the 11 day turnaround and come back in. Um, Josh Nasser was cramping, so he'll be fine. And then, yeah, Bell was just the cut that just opened up. Ironically, oh, the. Hmm. The injury that we, we didn't really talk about on the day and it's now sort of been the more concerning one is the one to Hunter Paisami, which is sort of a, I think a low to mid-grade MCL, which is now basically needing us a 12, which is a position that we don't really have that much depth in considering 
Malakai Fiketti got red carded in his shit shield qualifying final. Simon Karevi just seems is off the radar. Like he's, you know, according to his Instagram, he's off with the sevens girls and be underrated, just enjoying post Olympics life. So well, hey, all credit to him. I saw a photo with him at his, with Israel Folau. Uh It was doing the rounds. I think he's who's, in Japan. Who's right? that? Uh, we don't know who that is. Yeah, no, Sorry, we'll, we'll, we'll bleep that as well. That bleep the name's that well. yeah, we'll bleep that that part of the podcast as well. That name's redacted. Uh, we don't know who that is. Um, I think so- I think he's just returned to Japan, but he definitely was over in France. Like as of like last, the, I think he's come back as of last week. But definitely was spending a lot of time with the sort of like, sort of seven support crew and enjoying post Olympics life. So it's not exactly in sort of contention well put it this way if you if you're doing that sort of if if you're sort of off not sort of training away with a group or not sort of with them um it's very easy to see why joe's sort of gone locally with these other options so it's going to be an interesting sort of scenario oh no it's not interesting to see who ends up just filling that 12 gap mm. we'll, we'll get on to the 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 backs in a minute um just because i feel like that's probably where a lot of the interesting calls are I do want to shout out one or two more uh, forwards before we do that, though. I mean, first up, I think Carlo Tizano, uh, you know, sticking around um, is, I think he's really taken the, this opportunity by the scruff of his neck in terms of looking for work and uh, and finding those kind of successes and things like that, um, which has been really, really positive. Good to see him in there. But also um, Oxford graduate himself, Tom Robertson, um, who is back. Which is which is notable, which is an interesting decision, I think, for him to be parachuted straight into the side. Um, you know, off the back of that, um, back with you know, he's back obviously with the force now after that uh, nine month sabbatical, and obviously he was obviously coming back from a knee injury as well. Hopefully that that translates as, as well. But I also do forget that you know there was a period when he went, when he was a prop where he was really really good. So hopefully his that time will be uh, will be will be refreshed. Uh, Mr. Hartman, what are your thoughts on the uh, any any particular forwards that really stick out to you? I mean, this has been a bit of a tough one. Um, I, well, I mean, like, I can't really go fast. Fraser McWright and Rob Valentini. Fraser's not in the squad, though. Uh, he's not, but you know, he's there in spirit. Um, it's, it's what what we're missing. Um, we're missing. We're still missing Fraser, so there's still improvement. That's what I'm saying, like Carlo. I thought Carlo's taking his opportunity quite well. Uh, not to say that if I was to pick between Fraser and Carlo, I mean I would go Fraser because he's just got more experience. But that's not to say that I, I don't think Carlo is a good has done enough to earn his to earn his stripes and, and earn an extra extra go on this tour. He's been I thought he's I think he's been playing quite well. Yeah, but you know what's kind of the competition, you know. Um, but yeah, I mean that. Uh, Rob Valentini is probably the only world class player at the moment. Um, I thought mm. Nick Frost played has played quite well, and he was definitely kind of coming into that game. Um, well, you know, he, I think he played in against Georgia. I think. Um, yeah, no, and he's he good against Georgia. Ha- yeah, yeah, he's had a so kind of build up to to playing his best footy. So he's looking good to me. Um, but other than that, I, I can't really say I'm wowed. Um, Carlo Desano putting a good shift. Does he have that the uh, factor, the X factor that takes him from just being, you know, killing at the Super Rugby to being world class? Not sure. Um, or, you know, being able to kill at the international stage. Um, and Harry Wilson, I thought, also played quite well. Um, Queensland has been running his nuts for a while, but it's actually great to see that he's finally been able to back that up for the Wallabies. Mm. Yeah, it's a uh, let's yeah, look. There are there are some good players there, um, but I think I think you're being a bit har- being a bit harsh on uh, in terms of Bobby V being the only uh, world class player there. I think uh, Taniella would obviously would be a contender at least from a scrum level perspective. And um, I reckon there's some. Oh good yeah, sorry, here. of course, sorry, but you know players have been able to play a lot. Actually, hmm. yeah, sorry, I don't know, I don't know. Yeah, you know, you're right. That and Angus Bell, but yeah, um, Bell's a, Bell's a, Bell's a gun. Yeah, I do like yeah. Bill. Yeah. I'll, I'll make out one final shout out before we go to the backs, and that is, of course, uh, Josh Cannon, who will make his after kind of signing for the Reds, staying in Australian rugby. He will uh, be an uncapped player included in that 
in that Wallaby uh, front pack squad, which is uh, promising. I reckon he's he's got the makings of he had a really solid Super Rugby season, and I reckon he's got the makings of uh, of a good uh, good amount of performance in the, in him uh, in gold. So fingers crossed he can he can try and uh, either come off the bench. I reckon that he'll be uh, there'll be a bit of competition around in the in the in the engine room. So hopefully he can go in there. But uh, we'll move on. Uh, to the back line, to the backs. We'll, we'll kind of finish. I'll kind of uh, to round this off with like the full list at the end. Um, but there's a lot of notable changes, and I feel like we need to start in the centres um, with this particular spot because, as alluded to by Nathan a little bit earlier, um, no Hunter Paisami, which is big loss. I think he was he's been quite impressive uh, playing in the centres, um, and I feel like Len Ikitao has not been firing on all cylinders. Um, I feel like he's like, it's not exactly the explosivity that we've seen from him under uh, someone like, you know, like the Dave Rennie era where he carved up the box in, in ruthless fashion. Um, but there is players like Josh Fluke in there. Um, there is, you know, some um, Hamish Stewart is in there who is also uncapped, um, who could uh, loom as a particular option. Um, there's a lot of, uh, there are options out there but just untested at Wallaby level. Nathan, lo- most of the uncapped players are in this back are in the backs here. Uh, any particular thing that really stands out to you? I mean, the fact, well, the fact that we need a twelve, which I sort of alluded to before. I mean, that's a whole lot of battle. Of, it's going to be pretty much Hamish Stewart or David Fellaini. Where are you going to go? Um, unless, like, obviously Josh Fluke, you can throw over there, but he hasn't played twelve to sort of or. Him or Ikatel haven't really started at twelve. Which again, your point on Ikatel, I think he's been solid. He's just, you know, he's played against a backline that has in a backline that hasn't got much forward ball. I mean, you know, against a team which does a lot of rush defense that takes away the time and space to actually create. When he's doing a lot of the sort of passes out the back and a lot of stuff that won't sort of give you the highlights, but a key to Joe Schmidt's attack. So the key is now going to be finding a twelve he can actually gel with. And I think Hamish Stewart might be that guy, just as a. More a second playmaker, um, someone that has experience sort of leading a back line as, as that sort of 10, that can just marshal an attack, play a bit more sort of territory, but also take a lot of defensive pressure off him. Like both of those guys are wizards when it comes to organizing a back line and making the correct rate. So I'm very sort of excited to see. Um, I think we don't know yet if he's going to start, but I would, given he's been around the camp, I think Hamish Stewart's the next guy up. And I'd be very excited to see how he goes, particularly against a, Argentinian midfield, which are been were pretty good against the All Blacks. Like they were the main reason they carved them up in that first test. So when you look at those uncapped players, those sort of that twelve battle, what is what intrigues me the most? Yeah, I'm a bit worried about this about the back line to be honest, and particularly after watching that first test match um, by, by the lost Pum- by lost Pumas, and also because the lost Pumas um, have really improved their their kicking game and their back three have, have been solid. Um, for the last few years. And even though they're kind of in a similar situation to us in that some weeks they'll turn up and produce, they will be world-class quality uh, and knock off the, knock off the all blacks at home. Um, another week they'll come up and they'll, they'll just turn out bin juice. Um, you know, the, one week they'll, they'll beat for a, a misfiring France side and, and put them to the sword. And then the next week they'll be trash. Uh, it's, it's kind of similar to that. Um, Mr. Hartman, what are your thoughts of on the on the back line? And also, I kind of feel like there's particularly someone like you know Max Jorgensen, um, exciting Waratah, even someone like a Jake Gordon, uh, who do, do we think as well, particularly around the halves, um, are we any closer to figuring out exactly what the halves look like? I have thoughts, feelings, and opinions on Noah Alessio after this weekend gone. I actually think he had a pretty decent, a much better game. Um, than folks gave credit for. We, I mean, we alluded to that 50-22 that he kind of executed really, really well. But I actually think he he played all right. Um, uh, played a lot better than than some of the other games where he's looked very nervous and misfiring a little bit. What are your thoughts, uh, particularly in those halves combinations? Should Gordon come back? Uh, I like how you tried to pass over to me and then shared your opinion on Noah. Um, it's great stewardship there. Brumby, Brumby and, um, supporter. That's, that's how I do. <laughs> uh, very Noah level of talent. Yeah, look, um, I thought Noah was fine. I think people kind of, and this is what really, this is what really gets my gristle, is we know 
how uh, Schmidt wants to play. Um, if you've been living under a rock and never saw his island play, it was just tight, tight, tight. Um, runs off the rock. Um, and, you know, he he conducts it through his uh, uh, scrum half. Uh, um, so, you know, to, to that effect, look, I think Noah probably, I just, he's never really shone in any Wallabies game, I don't think. Um, Nathan, you have a better memory than me. You can, can, can correct me there. I think Jake Gordon. I like two years ago. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Um, Jake Gordon had a really good year in a really shit Tars team. And I think he's been playing really well. A lot of people have been criticizing him for, I guess, his kicking, especially in that first game. But, you know, we went from playing Wales and Georgia to playing South Africa. You know, you're not, you, you're not going to perform at your best. Uh, again, uh, it's a lot of Queenslanders riding Tate's nuts. Um, and look, Tate's a great player. To me, he's never really wowed either. Um, but he does inject a lot of pace. Um, and, you know, it's sad and it's it's good to see the baton being passed on, but it's also sad that, you know, Nick White isn't his former self because I think he really kind of missed out during his prime years to Nick Phipps. Um, I can definitely cast my mind back to when he scored the winning try against the All Blacks in Sydney. Sure, 2015. The All Blacks in Sydney, yep. 2015, um, yeah. Last game before that World Cup. Um, but, yeah, go, going through it, yeah. Totally agree with Hunter Pasami. He hasn't really wowed me this so far. Um, again, Queenslanders riding him short snarts. Uh, let's see how he goes. Hopefully it works out. Um, I've been a bit disappointed in Callaway. Um, Have you been excited by anyone? <laughs> uh, Jake Gordon. Oh, just Gordon. This South Wales coming through. Yep, yeah, yep, there we go. <laughs> no, it, like it, it is easy. I mean, Len, Lenny Cattell has been great as always. I, I find Kelly has been di- disappointing. Dalgunu, I didn't even get to Dalgunu, Nick. Dalgunu, I think that is perfect Schmidt. Like he's played the role that Schmidt wanted him to play perfectly. Um, uh, Cora Betty, great. Um, uh, and Tom Wright, as I think he's finally showing his promise. He, I, I can't really recall. I think he, he played poorly against Georgia, but I think he's been fantastic. It's a shame he's not he's coming just on the on... Who, Tom Wright? No, sorry, not Tom Wright, Dalgunu. Uh... Oh, yeah, after the, the broken leg. Yeah, yeah that kind of... that's right. But yes, sorry, Tom, Tom, Wright. Tom Wright, like, attackingly, probably hasn't been his best, but, like, his defensive work is some of the best he's had in his career. Like, he saved, I think, two or three tries at least in the last two games against us, the three box. Like, yeah. His scrambling work's been unbelievable. And once the attack sort of flows as well, like he's going to be a super player. I bet the Wallabies attack hasn't been flowing. So, you know, oh, yeah. let's just wait. But yeah, I, mean, okay. is, is, I was just going to say, yes. still, at least still making an impact, mm. which w- wasn't in the past. I think I think probably the most exciting change I, I want to see is uh, that 10 12. Uh, again, Queensland is running the nuts of Tom Liner. I'm not sure we want to do that quite now. And that that uh, I'm not sure if you listened to our last pod, Nick, but I said the same thing about Jorgo. Fantastic mm. player, don't get me wrong. Let's not burn him out. Yeah, I, I completely agree. And also, I think I, I probably take a similar position to Jorgo as I do to Tom Liner. Um, like I feel like we, we, when we talked about the whole situation around uh, around the, the fly half position. I mean, people can disagree with, with the whole Noah situation. And, yeah, he hasn't exactly been firing, but I will be damned if you make – if you throw yet another exciting fly half into the into the mincer before he's ready. And Tom Lyon is still young. I don't think he's ready. I don't think you really should start introducing him as, into the starting side on a regular basis until after the Lions tour at least. Um, and I think maybe Jorgo, keep him in the squad, keep him around, make it clear to them that there's a plan in place. Um, but, uh, yeah, I reckon just keep keep drip feeding him in, uh, you know, either off the bench or, you know, maybe the occasional start against a kind of a, you know, a side that you can afford to try a few things around um, and build from there. So, no, that, that's a fair one. So, all right then, to finish this point, uh, this point off on this particular 
uh, squad. Um, who then is, if seeing as we've both kind of talked about, I feel like we're just really set on those centres. Um, and I feel like the rest of the squad, I think, really picks itself in terms of the back three um, and, uh, and and the, and the kind of the halves at the moment, whether it be Gordon or, or White um, or, you know, or indeed McDermott. Um, you know, we, we got a pretty clear sense of what it's going to look like when that happens. Um, who is our 12 and 13 for that first test match? Nathan? Uh, I think I said it said alluded to it before. Um, I'd go Hamish Stewart and Lenny Tau. I think just a perfect partnership that I'd be interested to see t- try out in the Schmidt system. Nick? Yeah, me too. Although, like, the only misgiving is uh, I don't imagine they've played together before. That's my thoughts. That's kind of my my thoughts. I, that's why I was like, maybe there's a question around. I mean, Fluke and um, Fluke and Stewart have played a little bit before together before, haven't they? Yeah, they probably would cross paths at the Reds. Um, I mean, like they've been in camp together for a solid two months now. Like they would have trained together enough to overcome that barrier, in my opinion. Mm. True. Fair enough. Well, look, either way, there's a lot to watch there. So to finish off, looking at the entire squad, the forwards we'll, we'll mention now from top to bottom, Alan Alatoa, Angus Bell, Angus Blythe, Josh Cannon, Matt Fesler, Nick Frost, Lange Gleeson, Tom Hooper, Isaac Kalia, who we'll get to on another bit of news in a second, Josh Nasser, BPA, Tom Robertson, Luke Hahn, Salah Kailoto, Slipper, Kyle Tizzato, Tupo, Valentini, Williams, and Harry Wilson. And then in the backs, of course, Benny Dolson, David Phillip, uh, I knew I fucking would trip over his name. Uh, Philip, fucking hell! Now I'm overthinking it. Fell you. People got people. Fell you. Fast, people just yeah, going to no. fast forward through this part anyway, Nick. That's fine. Josh <laughs> Fluke, Jake Gordon, Lenny Kitao, Giorgo, Andrew Kellaway, Marika Corbetti, Lalesio, Liner, McDermott, Pete Stewart, Tool, Nick White, and Tom Wright. That is our squad that will be going to Argentina, which is very exciting. The other big news uh, before we wrap up this podcast, there's a couple of final pieces of news. Of course, the other big result was uh, the All Blacks absolutely creaming the the Pumas at uh, at Eden Park, 42 to 10, 50th uh, win or the 50th result that didn't result in a loss to the All Blacks at Eden Park. That's a freaking ridiculous record. Let's be 100% honest. Um, fun fact, watching that game, did anyone notice the fact that the All Blacks also have an unbeaten night record at Murrayfield in Scotland of 19 games? That is savage, and I feel sorry for any Scottish fan who had to watch that because that statistic is brutal uh, in terms of a, of a result. Hmm. That was assault. That was assault, brother. I can't believe that. I can't <laughs> believe they would have exposed him like that. That's Yeah, I know. That's harsh. Like, <laughs> I felt that from here. and I... <laughs> But the, uh, the other kind of big news, which kind of dropped uh, today at the time of us recording this, uh, Nathan, I'll, I'll throw to you for this particular piece of news, um, is uh, there's some change afoot in the uh, in the all-black coaching staff. Yeah, it's interesting. Um, I don't think many people saw this coming, but they basically came out with a quite brutal statement and said um, Liam McDonald would depart as assistant coach, probably – five games into his tenure under Scott Robertson. And yeah, it was a real sort of honest press conference that um, Razor gave. And um, the statement put out basically laid it out that the, just the coaching philosophy between the two just didn't mix. Like the fact that they sort of openly said, oh yeah, these conversations have been going on for a couple of weeks. It's like, you've only been in camp for a couple of weeks. What do you mean? But, you know, there is history between the two of um, coaching together and then Leon moving on. So I think this is the, the, I, this sort of adult to the room making an adult decision being like, Hey, look, we thought we, we spent enough time together in the past and we thought we'd got, we gone over, got it over whatever rugby issues we had. We haven't. So let's just go before this becomes toxic. I, I wonder if they had a blow up and they've just front footed, um, front foot, front foot blocked this by just putting out the most positive upfront press release. Potentially, yeah. It's not, it's not yeah. bad. Like, the reverse conspiracy theory. Yeah. I, I would say, like, the, the, this is a brutal, a pretty br- uh, blunt press release as press, press releases go. And it did actually make me think, like, you know, like, obviously you have to well-groom every sort of press release and make sure that what you say is 
you know, covers the right thing. If this is what is being said in this press release, imagine the shit they can't say uh, around exactly what's happened here. So I'll get on the I'll get on the the tinfoil hat conspiracy theory with you then. You can just say maybe there was a maybe there was a tiff. He said he's dancing shit. <laughs> Ray, Ray Gun's better than you, yeah. mate. Yeah. Oh, yeah. shit. I rec- it, now, there's something I need to see. I need to see Razor and Ray Gun have a dance-off. Uh, so if if the, if the All Blacks win the Bledisloe, would he do a dance? Surely. Oh, no. No, it'd have to be a World Cup. It'd have to be a World Cup. I mean, like... No, nah, hang on. No, hang on. No, I, I feel disrespectful if he didn't do a dance because that means he doesn't value the Bledisloe. Yeah. What are you yeah. trying to say? That's, that a super rugby title is worth more than Bledisloe? Nah, get fucked. Do it, do it. <laughs> dance, Razor, dance. <laughs> <laughs> yep, I like it. <laughs> uh, the other big news, and Mr. Hartman, I'll get your opinion on this particular one, is Ooh. there was an announcement at uh, the Waratahs today. Of course, there's been, you know, a drip feed of, of announcements uh, coming into the squad, a lot of players who, you know, made the transition over from Melbourne um, over to, to Darcyville. Um, there's a very exciting assistant squads being named. Lots of, uh, you know, Dan McKellar, of course, has been named. But Isaac Kalia is the player who uh, will sign on for 2025 to uh, to the Waratahs, um, joining his his other Rebels teammate Tani Altupo there. There's obviously going to be Angus Bell there as well. How do we feel about Isaac Kalia? Thoughts, feelings, opinions in Sky Blue? Do we like it? Are we happy? Um. Look, I, I'm very happy. I, the broader sense is, though, that oh, you, like, you hate to say it, but look, if this is what's happening because we're, we've contracted the teams we've got by 20%, just adds that extra layer of depth across all teams. Um, like the Brumbies picked up um, Feliway, I think, Nathan, the other yeah. day, and... Reds have picked up uh, Luke and Sanclodo and someone else. It's Basically, just, every it, second rower. Yeah, it's like it, it is really exciting. But you know, on the flip side, you kind of feel that Super Rugby's in its exit stages. Like you know, we've rocked up to the party at uh, ten p.m. with all the <laughs> booze, and everyone's about to leave. So yeah, um, yeah, very exciting. I. I Sad that God, you sound it. Very exciting. Yeah, you, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, you sound <laughs> surreal right now. That was the I'm, least I've ever How do you work? Oh, I'm excited. I can't believe it. <laughs> Why didn't you fucking That's... just say that then? Fuck. Because I'm mission and rational. Yeah, um, I yeah. <laughs> No, I... it's good. It's good. What makes me, you know, a little bit hard, a little bit wet, um, reminds me that I have loins, is thinking about that front row next year. Tongan Thor, Pareki, uh, Angus Bell. Yeah, and like your, your points around Super Rugby are fair, but I think as soon as we start getting some Australian success, like that comp all of a sudden becomes a lot more relevant. Like we, the Absolutely. reason why it's sort of fallen off is yeah, we just don't have, we just get beat. And you know, whilst yes, the way this has sort of happened that we're becoming a lot more sort of competitive around these players joining other clubs, not ideal. But what happens when you have twenty million dollars of debt to the tax man? That Hey, we can at least sort of hopefully take advantage of it on the field and be a bit more competitive against the Kiwis. And I mean, moves like Kyler joining just add just further quality to a Waratahs team, which are looks pretty stacked next year. When you add Callaway, um, as you said, Tupai, Rob Leota, who's going to come back from injury, and uh, yeah, yeah. this this, out, this outside backslash center that's coming through, uh, Joseph Swali, just carving up the NRL, one of the Not best close. teenagers. One, yeah, just one of the best. Under twenty one talents currently in world rugby, you know, just coming, coming back Actually, to back to union. Can we just talk about Swahili for a bit? So, um, obviously, a bit of news going around because Carter Gordon's been playing for um, the southeast uh, southeast Queensland Crushers or whoever, um, yeah. and uh, Marky Mark is. Uh, uh, um, Made his Chooks. debut for the yeah the Trucks reserves. What a fucking waste! I I just what a fucking waste. Why would you go to rugby league? And look, this is not an anti rugby league thing. But if you're a fucking professional rugby player, go to France, go to Japan, go to a great new culture, 
earn a lot more money and then you can always come back and you go to rugby league, you have to change your game for, you know, yeah. a, a place what where, a, where your salary gets capped quite literally. Yeah, but they've got family obligations and shit. Like, you don't know the full context. Like, probably they want to stay in Australia for a reason or, you know, Carter might want to go back home. Um, it might be multiple factors in there. I mean, you, you would make a shit ton more money. But, I mean, like, did you see freaking Marky Mark's debut? He carved up. he got to try yeah, like, no shit. He's a he's a test player. Like, yeah, I know. That's, that's, that's so I mean, like league, well. playing league is different though to playing union. I mean, like it's not going to necessarily happen overnight. You, you, some it's, some people take to it like a, a duck to water, but some don't. He's a winger. Like that's the only yeah, comparable true. position. It's like it's like Michael Jordan. He's like Mark is playing as plumbers and mailman. That's all it is. Like, yeah. <laughs> like he's quite literally like people like Carter Gordon goes out there or like carbs up reserve grade. And everyone goes, Oh wow. Look at this. Well, how good is he? It's like, yeah, no shit. He's playing. He's like, fucking good. He was good at a world cup. He was mm. good against super Rugby, against much better talent. Some that would come in and carve up the NRL as well. And we're all of a sudden surprised that he's really good at reserve grade. Likewise, Marky coming off an Olympics. Mm. No yeah. shit. <laughs> like I mean, it, every, even Michael Jordan relaxed. hit a ball when he played baseball. So yeah, mm. I, like, but it's just the, such a fucking waste. Why? It's because like, I mean, that's if you want to build a profile, I, that's the reality. Is the NRL is just so far ahead of everyone else. It controls the media, it controls a lot of the money, and if you want to sort of have a go at it, and you're getting people whisper sweet nothing in your ear about how great a star you're going to be, then and the money that comes with it, you're going to go over there. Mm. Like and the reality is, a lot of these guys, like everyone talks about, oh, code ball, oh, uh, these league, you know, leagues coming into GPS schools and CIS schools and taking all the all the sort of people. It's like these kids grow up like playing union on a Saturday and league or a Sunday or vice versa. Like they're just kids; they're playing both. And I've, at this stage, rugby league has more opportunities. There are sixteen teams compared to our four. Like, yeah, like, it can yeah, happen. Yeah. They have more money than us; they're going to recruit it. Just let the flow happen. You're right. I kind of will let the flow happen. Like you can only let it happen. But what I I kind of push back on that is the real kind of thing there is that rugby has to control that pathway. And due to it, uh, rugby in Australia not being managed well, that pathway is slipped out under the feet. Like whatever you can do, and I'm sure there's many options available. Is to secure those pathways. It's so easier said than done, though. Like the, I mean, true, error, true. Error where literally the pathways are more skewed than ever, in the sense of just like there's as as I was saying, everyone's playing is trying to play as many sports as they can. Like you're having you now these like you have like Brad Fitless' son playing for the Waratahs under sixteen. Like he's always going to play for the Roosters, but everyone looks at him and goes, "Oh, that's that's no one missing the pathway." It's like. He was never really in the pathway to begin with. You just got mm, people mm. trying to build the best 16 and 19 squads, give them that experience. And if they join, great. And if they don't, cool. Like there's still there's still quality people coming through that pathway. I mean, for goodness sakes, we had a 19-year-old kid go out there on, on debut against the world champs and look the goods. Like well, there are still kids coming through there with exceptional talent. Have you heard about this guy down in uh, playing for the Tasmanian basketball team who they, they cut from – um, their team because he went back to Brisbane and played rugby after they told him not to. Forget, Have you heard about this part, kid? Yeah, uh, oh, I was looking at him before. I can't remember his name off the top of I my head. I think his name is um, Simon something. Nah, it's but like because he did an or interview. Ramon. Um, Romeo might be it. Um, because he, he did an interview today. It was it's, he's a great example as well where he got asked like, oh, so um, Roman Sulipa. Su- Sudalipa is his name. That does not sound like Simon. <laughs> no, no, Ramon, Ramon, Simon, Mon. Roman name starts with an S. Roman, so. Simone, somewhat there. But I've done pretty well. Asked, he, he got asked like, oh, like you started out in rugby, why did you move? He's like, oh, basically my, I enjoyed it for a bit, but those my parents are pushing that way and I, I wanted more of a challenge. I went to basketball. Like, so he's a basketball person through, like, he wants to play basketball. That's what he wants to do. And everyone looks at, oh, there's a talent going to basketball. It's like, he was like that we've lost. It's like, he was never there. But he was really not there to begin with. It's not like he was 
had like where you see those American colleges where you like you got the two hats. Was it union or basketball? Am I going to go this way or this way? It's like no, it was always just a basketball that just got pushed in the rugby because he was a kid and that's what his parents did. I was going to say uh, on this particular topic. You know how often people talk about signing MOUs and shit, like, uh, you know, signing M- uh, a memorandum of understanding with, like, Japan or whatever, which is what I know the NZIU have done. I think we've done uh, it's something in some capacity. Should we sign one with League, just seeing as now, like, the, just let the, on that point of the floodgates opening, seeing as, like, you know, a lot of these kids now play both games a lot of these kids now are looking for opportunities. I mean, how many times have you heard conversations about, I don't know, the Hammer? I've heard the Hammer say that he wants to play, he's wanted to give Union a go. And I've heard freaking Cleary say he wants to give Union a go at some point. Like, why not just embrace the realities that a lot of these kids now are actually just playing both sports? And maybe by having it be, you know, a porous thing, you can play League or you can play Union. Um, Maybe it might actually open up more opportunities, and you and league, in, in fact, becomes a, a secret source of support for. But that's not, you know, that's not happening. That, I know it's not happening, not happening, but like, would that does that sound like the best solution here? When when we think of you know players going, oh, it's such a waste them going over the league. Well, maybe it's a, situ- a sign of the times. Well, I still think it's a waste of them going to league, and it's got nothing to do with the development pathways. I think the development pathway question is: yes, they're playing two games. I guess. You letting it happen both ways is it's a 14 year old kid, you know, and you're saying in some scenario they're going, you can only play union, not league. Yeah, okay, in that case, let them play both. But what's happening, it or what people are complaining about, because like I'm not on the I'm not on the ground, I'm not on the front lines, but it's how do you convince those kids who've got talent and interest in rugby union to choose rugby union? And to, to, against Nathan's point of what can you do, if you look at Isaac Heaney, who plays for the Sydney Swans, he grew up in Newcastle. And he, because the AFL have done so much ground root, groundwork on the grassroots, he could play AFL. And then the Swans pursued him to then go play for the Swans. Now, why would you play AFL over rugby league when you play rugby league and potentially go play in the south of France, like I said? I don't know, but I, I I just that thing. How do you fix it? I've got no idea. Yeah, it's it's one of those. How easy much work? Points, but... Yeah, but how much work is being put into it? I just don't have the confidence. That's my. I don't have the confidence that the smartest and bet and hardest work is going into that. Um, I know. I know there's work going into it. I know, like there's, but it, like it is not as easy as people say. Like, like there's that sort of mentality out there that, oh, nothing's been done in grassroots. You don't see it. Like, you don't see much grassroots works. Like, the best grassroots works is the stuff behind the scenes that you don't see. And trust me, they're, they're putting in, they're putting in a shift. Like, they're going, they're going to places which league and AFL won't touch as well with, you know, classic Wallabies and everyone else just to give them an exposure to the game that you're not going to yeah. have. The, the problem is, again, you're going into a, a gunfight with a spoon. Like, they have a lot more money than we do. Yeah, absolutely. They can spend a lot absolutely. more money, and th- therefore you get a lot more of that visual cues and sort of awareness of it. So that's the challenge that's, uh, that we're sort of facing. But that's like a purely rugby Australia money issue. But in terms yeah. of strengths, that rugby rugby has a lot of strengths over the other two codes. For example, you could sell it as if you come join with rugby, and then your rugby career doesn't work out. You've got all these business leaders. Who know you like you could do a partnership thing like that for example you and there are a lot like that the, again to come go back to Zara Falau, for example there was a guy who was sponsoring him giving him i think a million a year or topping up five hundred thousand a year he was just some rich benefactor who lived in double bay like i think they they could be smarter about it i don't know what they're doing um they might be doing the best that they possibly can nathan but it's just a bit I just don't have that confidence. Um, but to go back to the second point, Nick, there is why do we care about them going? I just, I don't understand it from, I don't understand. It's not a logical decision. That's what I'm trying to say. I just, if you're in that position, yeah, you got to look after family. That might be the only reason why you stay. But Honey Badger, for example, said he left to look after his family because his dad had, he had like 13 brothers or something. One of them had autism or cerebral palsy or something like that. But he went to Japan to earn money. 
So, yeah. I, but yeah, anyway, look, I, I, I can't go into their personal decisions. So I just think it's fucking stupid. Hmm. Well, I think the answer to all of this is let's move the Chiefs to Western Sydney. I reckon that's the that's the best uh, the best place. It would help. Go. It would help. It would absolutely it would. help. <laughs> I, I mean, look, I think probably one big strategic decision that could be made is you can pick the Wallabies wherever they play around the world. Um, that would also put pressure on the overseas competitions. So like France and England, because, you know, they've got Callaway and Tonga and Thor instead of an English or a French player, which I think is good for us, or a Welsh player or Irish player, whatever, you, whatever, whatever have you. It also means we pay less in wages. It also means there's a spot for a kid coming out of high school. Seeming so it's like think, a simulation of the box, you mean? Little baby been doing. Yeah, yeah. Mm. Sorry, no. I was just going to say, I think that this is, again, we've basically just gone into like Twitter in a nutshell here. This I last know. 15 minutes has just been Twitter in a nutshell. Like, <laughs> this, this whole thing we, we can cover and deep dive into another pod. I can't even remember. Wait, did we start on Isaac Kailia? Is that how we, we did? Got and here? that's all I literally was like starting about. And I had like as as a as a. And, we and, got here? I don't know. Nick, Nick Nick's uh, taken us down a little rabbit hole. It's uh, <laughs> we were... sorry, sorry for a conversation taking place. I'm sorry. I know. Please. How dare you? How dare you have an in-depth conversation and discussion about uh, issues that are facing Australian rugby? Like, uh, and we are not criticizing uh, Nathan's current employees. No. no, I wasn't saying you were. I was just saying yeah, we're just, I just passionate just, fans. We're passionate. Fans. I was I was trying to like draw oh. it back to the point. I'm like, fuck, I have no idea how we got it, but hey, let's just keep rolling. Let's roll. Yeah. On that on that particular subject of talent leaving, the other kind of key news point that I was going to mention before we wrapped up um, was uh, Kevin Foot, uh, certain Rebels coach. Um, he's heading back to his place of birth, South Africa. Um, he's joining a certain fan of the pod. Shout out to Dave Vessels, uh, who I believe still listens. I don't know if he is or not, but uh, yeah, shout out to Dave, um, who is now kind of taken up a very senior role. I think director of, of high performance, or actually director of rugby in, in South Africa. So he's he's doing very well for himself. Um, and Kevin Foote is set to become the head coach of the under twenty Springboks. So talk about you know leaving uh, Australia with your uh, pedigree or your stocks firmly raised um, after that, you know, strong year at the at the Rebels that saw them make an inaugural final. I mean, you know, it is what it is. I think he, I, I think some people probably, you know, think he's a bit, been a bit hit and miss uh, in terms of his time as a coach um, and his, in terms of his performancing. But uh, whatever the situation, um, he's, you know, definitely left. He definitely uh, saw improvement in that final year at the Melbourne Rebels and, uh, Good luck to him. Um, it's a shame he won't be sticking around in Australian rugby, but it is what it is. Uh, Dewey, it's a, you know, that, that's kind of the other, the, the last kind of big major news piece for us in terms of talent sticking around. I know also Sam, Sam Talakai has also announced he's going to Glasgow Warriors as well, um, which is a, which is another big piece of news. Final point for both of you lads. Uh, we, will be, we will have a, a squad next week uh, for this first match against Argentina. Um, we will have, you know, we'll get a sense of what Joe is going to be trying to go for with this particular squad. Um, what does success, does success look like from this tour? Honestly, two wins, uh, a win and a loss, just playing better on the field. What would we consider a coming home from Argentina, uh, you know, in, successfully? What does it look like? I think it was like... We've sort of talked about improvement against South Africa and all that, but like we need at least a win. At least they win in Argentina. Like, yeah, it's a tough place to win, but you need some kind of confidence. And you're now at that point of, all right, if we, you lose both these games, you can't afford to go 0 and 6 in the rugby championship. So you need some kind of victory just to, you know, show that the improvement's there. And not only the improvement's there, but the improvement is leading to results. Nick, what do you think? Um, yeah. One win is good enough. One win, but I think it's more how we play. Mm -hmm. I, I like, yeah, I, I'd agree. With, yeah, I'd, I'd agree with that. It's a shame because uh, we want we want to uh, we want a Puma Trophy heist. Well, we actually need a, a, tr a trophy heist now because we don't have the Puma Trophy at the moment. So we don't. 
No, we don't. Last year, uh, Argentina won it for the first time. <laughs> yeah. That's what off the belt. And why is it a Puma, um, why is it a Puma trophy? Like, why do they get all the credit? Actually, I don't know. Well, Let's Google it. Should we go? We should make it the Puma Wallaby trophy. Have like a Puma yeah, and a Wallaby okay. like an arm wrestle. Right? <laughs> a hybrid, a hybrid sketched hybrid, out yeah. by um, John O'Neill. <laughs> sort it. Let's get commissioning on it. What are we doing? Like just yeah. sitting here and waiting back. Like, come on. Surely there's yeah. some someone that can create a, like a an awesome wallaby that can be added to this puma. Like just riding the top of the puma. Wikipedia doesn't have shit on this. Like, uh, why is it called the Puma Trophy? Like, surely there'd be something symbolic. They should call it the Checker, the Checker Cup. Now that's what they should call it. Uh, the Checker Deck. The Checker Deck. <laughs> Maybe the Empanada Hot Pie. Oh my god. <laughs> that could work. Common, work. common cultural connection. Yeah. Oh, good. Empanada hot pie. <laughs> Just trying to imagine how that would look like in bronze. Just like a pie with an empanada <laughs> Just sticking an out. Just an empanada and a hot pie. We have to have oh, like, like a bite taken out of them. Yeah, I like it. It's like we'll definitely be, we'll be, we'll definitely have more personality in the F three cup. Uh, just a piece of concrete from the from the, from the freeway. Loads of, that's loads of personality. That has got way more personality than the Puma Trophy. It's true. I actually do like it. It's a good trophy. It is a good trophy. The F three, uh, the F three cup. And I mean, what like the Springboks? Uh, it's a Mandela plate. Like, why is it named after one South African? Isn't it meant to be two people? Yeah, no, it is. You like- know, like there's got to be a connection. And you also can't drink out of it. It's a plate. It's a bit yeah. shit. What's the point? Yeah, exactly. Uh, but yeah. Anyway, she was a, a short and sweet one again, as usual. Uh, sticking sticking to that consistency. Um, we'll be back next week talking, uh, previewing uh, the the, fir- the ne- first test match in Argentina, um, and the next match of the uh, of the rugby championship. Fingers crossed. Uh, next time we're talking about this, we've got, got the makings of a, an exciting squad, and hopefully. They come back with some positive results. But another episode of the Dropped Kickoff in the can. Enjoy your weekend, everyone. Find something to do. Watch some club rugby. Have a beer. Lie down. Do what you need to do. Thank you very much, everyone. Arigato.